So. Hallo, liebe ZuschauerInnen. Hallo, liebe ZuschauerInnen hier und zu Hause. Ich bin Luca Sonnen, die Projektassistentin von Burning Issues meets Kampnagel. I'm going to switch to English now because our next keynote will be held in English. I'm Luca Sonnen, the project assistant of Burning Issues meets Kampnagel. So, hello, dear audience. Today I'm here to announce Sonja Lindforsch. She is a Cameroonian Finnish choreographer, also the founding member and artistic director of Urban Appa. Urban Appa is an interdisciplinary and counter-hegemonic arts community that offers a platform for new discourses and feminist art practices. She has already been here at Camp Nagel 2019 with her play Cosmic Latte. This time she's here since Friday, offering her workshop Triple D, Decentralizing, Decolonizing and Dreaming, open for BPOC only. Sonia is known for her critical view in arts, also feminist leadership for changing structures is an important topic for her. So just so you know, there will be a Q&A after her speech. So the audience here and at home, um, send in your questions. The number is 016069439900. Now please welcome everybody Sonja Lindforsch with her keynote, Working with Friction Towards Intersectional Feminist Stages. Woohoo! Hey everybody. So my name is Sonja Lindforsch. Oh, no longer the slide, but my name is Stone Lirpors, and I'm a choreographer and artistic director, as said, of Urbanapa, an anti-racist and intersectional feminist art platform in Helsinki, Finland. And all my work deals with structures in one way or another. And during the past few years, I've been busy with black performance, speculative fictions, and decolonial dreaming practices. Art is important. Art is vital. Art can tell stories about histories and identities, about what is good and what is important. Art can give us new perspectives. Art has the potentiality to dream of futures that we don't know yet how to dream of. But that becomes impossible if the field of art is homogeneous, exclusive and discriminatory. So yeah, my topic today is working with frictions towards anti-racist feminist stages. And as we all know, the world is unfair, unequal, hierarchical, and often violent. So practicing anti-racism and feminism already creates friction. Let's have a look at Hamburg. Hamburg is a diverse city whose inhabitants come from different heritages. But is this diversity reflected on the art field? Who is here? Who is not here? And if somebody is not here, why are they not here? And what could be done to change this? Who defines what is art or what is good art, interesting art, meaningful art? Where and by whom is knowledge created? Who are the gatekeepers? So during my talk, I will ask questions, and I will ask those questions repeatedly. So again and again and again. And then I'll share some tools that, and practices that have been useful for me. Uh, but before we start, I just want to remind everybody what we are aiming towards. So the aim is equality and world peace. And diversity is not the end goal, but just actually the beginning. This is, of course, not an easy task, but if we cannot even dream of an equal art world, how could we know how to build towards that? So here we go. My first tool is, boom, talk about norms, talk about them repeatedly, and try to make power structures visible. So I always, yeah, like my, my students sometimes like are bored because I always start with norms. What is a norm? Uh, this is just one definition. Norms are social codes of conduct that contain an assumption of how things should be. Norms are built up so that certain communities get accustomed to keeping certain practices as normal, acceptable, or preferred. Repetition is key. 
Norms are often invisible, and the closer to the norms you are, the harder it is to acknowledge them. We have, for example, an ability norm, whiteness norm, cisgender norm, gender binary norm, heteronorm, and many others. So it is important to remember that norms are not natural. When the universe started 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang, it was like, hey, now we have whiteness and we have like this gender binary. No, those are human-made concepts, cultural contracts. So during different times, different things have been normalized, and normalization happens, like said, through repetition. Norms are not necessarily bad, but when we forget that norms are constructed and start to consider them as natural or this is the way the uh, world should be, we have a problem. Norms are constructed and yet they are really real and have real effects of on real people and real bodies. When there is a norm, a center, there's also someone who is left outside of the norm, the other, the marginalized, the abject. A short anecdote. So, 10 years ago, I read a paper on feminist aesthetics uh, where Finnish professor Kirsi Saarekangas wrote about the norms in architecture. In Finland, as late as in the 70s, kitchens were built to measure a woman's average height, whereas living spaces were designed for men. So I am approximately 164 centimeters tall. If I would enter that kitchen, it would be like, wow, everything fits perfectly. It's so easy to wash the dishes and make food and great, just operate here. Whereas if my brother, who is 194 centimeters tall, would go into that kitchen, <sighs> so, so uncomfortable and hard. The kitchen is telling him, maybe you should go into the living spaces because the kitchen is not really made for you. And okay, this sounds really banal, but when I read this paper, like my mind blew. I was like just walking uh, in the world uh, for several weeks, like trying to denaturalize everything, trying to understand that everything has ideology. Everything human-made has ideology. This has ideology, this has ideology, that, that. So even here, in this space, who has created this space? What kind of ideology is it carrying? Who, to whom was it designed for? Or this notion of art, this art field, this theater performance, this nation, this school system, who was it designed for? Because often when we design things, spaces, concepts, or art, we design for the norm. And if we don't acknowledge the norm, then it is hidden. We often also have the fantasy that, hey, everybody's welcome to this theater performance and this stage and this school. Everybody's welcome, but that is untrue. My friend, who is a disabled artist, often asks in their workshop, did you count how many steps or thresholds there were when you entered this space? And in my case, the answer is no, I didn't, because I belong into that ability norm. If the cities would be built so that every place would be wheelchair accessible, moving with a wheelchair would not be a problem. So, the closer to the norm you are, the harder it is to notice them because then often things are made for you. Things are designed for you. Places and spaces are easily accessible. Things fit, like me in the kitchen. Nothing stops the flow. And this is called privilege. So if we want to make the art field more inclusive, anti-racist, intersectionally feminist, we need to start by acknowledging our privileges. So here is an exercise. Uh, it's called the Teflon test. Maybe some of you have seen it. And I use it sometimes 
as a conversation starter to talk about privilege. So this could be done as an ice maker, for example, in a board meeting, at school, or maybe at the beginning of a new production. And it is quite simple, uh, like a magazine test. You can even do it right now if you want to. So, uh, I get into difficult situation never. You get zero points. Sometimes you get one point. Often you get two points because of my ethnicity, sex, gender, social class, sexual orientation, religion, belief, language, ability, age, and then the list could go on. So this is not a comprehensive list. This is just some of the threats that I've been using. And here the maximum is 18 points. So you can, yeah, you can maybe take a second and to see how many points you get. And the test, it's called Teflon because the less points you have, the more privilege you have. So Teflon shield is like privilege. This means that you can go on in your life, like just stroll through your life without being stopped by ableism, transphobia, homophobia, transphobia, or other kinds of discrimination. And an, import, an important thing that I noticed when I did first this test is that even though I'm a black woman and I suffer from racism, I still have a lot of privilege. I come from a middle class background, I'm cis, I'm able-bodied, I speak multiple languages. This means that I will still have many blank spots. I will not notice sometimes some types of discrimination. Moving on to tool number two, which is you are not separate. And then this question of freedom of art. Even though we think we're past modernism, the notion of art as something free, something separate from the histories and entanglements of the so-called real world still exists very strong. As an artist, uh, and here I would maybe need to say uh, an artist belonging to the norm, as a free agent that can investigate or interrogate different subjects or themes from an objective distance. So I can a uh, little bit look at this, I now interrogate this, da 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 da, I'm working with that, I'm working with that, I can touch everything but be kind of working from a distance. So, and this conversation is now going very strongly, like in Finland, about this freedom of art or who is free, who is free to operate and who is not. And on several different occasions this fall, a white cis trait, an able-bodied established artist has claimed that intersectional feminism or racism is restricting their freedom of art. And now that freedom is at stake and that freedom should be defended. So again, whose freedom are we talking about anyway? The established artist's freedom to make homophobic or transphobic art, racist art, or to exploit the exclusivity of the art field, or the freedom of the artists and makers that are left outside or marginalized? Whose freedom is most important? And also, if all of those art institutions and artists would put their energy in the fight for equality, we would already be there. Uh, here is uh, Antonio Banderas playing Picasso, the artist, stating several things that I've heard this fall. I am neutral. Freedom of art! Sometimes I'm inspired by other primitive cultures I take inspirations and turn things into art. It's not stealing. I'm not limited by a single issue, like you, Sonia. Actually, I'm not interested in politics, just art making. I've earned my place in the art field. If they would just make better art, they would make it too. This is not about, about privilege, this is about skills. Also, I would uh, have to add uh, here this, can't I do anything anymore? Isn't anything anymore available for me? So these are 
fun things that we have learned this fall. And uh, to all of those who still believe in this neutrality or separation, I have just one thing to stay, say, and that is wake up, you're living in a dream world. The artist is in no way outside of the system. We live in a world of norms, values, ideologies, hierarchies, and histories. What happens in art or on the cultural field is not separate from the so-called real world. Art does not merely mirror or imitate. I'm just mirroring, I'm just imitating the real world. No, it produces and creates new realities and or strengthens the existing ones. We are always operating and creating from our positionalities, even when we claim to be neutral. Let go, like Elsa in Frozen says, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. You're not neutral. Great, so let's go, I'm sweating. Great, <laughs> letting go is hard work. <sighs> so uh, my third tool is Go back to the beginning, acknowledge historical entanglements. We are constantly dancing with ghosts. Our norms, our bodies, our histories, our languages, our cultures, and our art carries histories within. So for example, me being on this stage with my body carries histories, histories of black performances, histories of black performers that were on stages before me. I'm constantly dancing with them. Sometimes the ghosts can be supporting. Sometimes the ghosts are also ugly and we want to forget them. Often here, we want to forget that capitalism, colonialism, religion, and the creation of Western art go hand in hand. Art hasn't been for everybody, but for the few and select. Art was used to distinguish class difference, the high from the low, and the West from the rest. Scholar Stuart Hall argues that the notion of Westernity as something progressive, intelligent, and liberal has been constructed by creating the other, a narrative of the rest or the so-called global South as something primitive, savage, backwards, historical and people of color, black, indigenous people as less than human. So these are the ghosts that we're dancing with. Again, everything human made has ideology. To whom have these stages been created for? To whom our notion of Western art has been made for? Who is left outside? Our institutions were created for a monoculture. Monoculture, a homogenous group of people, for example, in the Western theater, only uh, straight cis men first. Uh, and then a homogenous group of people on stages and then also on the audience. Time has passed and the world has changed, but our theaters still operate very similarly as hundreds of years ago. How to change things then? I think this is the question. My answer is I don't know. I don't know, but at least I think we need to shake every single thing. If we want systemic change, we first need to understand the systemic ecologies, entanglements and connections. And then the challenge is that we, can change, we can't change just one thing. We have to shake every single thing, starting from the notion of art. Notion of art, production modes, institutions, education, knowledge production, uh, art criticism. Uh, what is art? Whose art is art? Whose art is culture? Whose body can be an artist? Who's, who, who cannot? Uh, why, why is this interface like this? I was talking to a friend from Burkina Faso and we were just wondering like, why is it that I'm dancing here and then somebody is just sitting in the darkness statically? Why is it like this? It could be another way as well. So, again, 
We can't change just one thing. We need to shake every single thing. And this means a radical renegotiation that needs to take place on multiple levels. We need to understand that Western art is as cultural and as ethnic as every other form of expression. This means that with concepts formulated in this ca canon, you cannot read everything. An art critic that goes to just any performance and I can read it. No, you cannot because you don't have access to all knowledges. We need to understand that we don't understand. We need to understand that we don't understand and we can't understand. And that there are many things that are lost in translation. We need to move from a single center art field to an art field that has multiple center, centers, a pluriverse where different kinds of expressions, knowledges, ways of working, and aesthetics are acknowledged and can coexist without the need of coherence. Okay, changing structures is hard. It needs more time and more resources than just upholding the current system. And sometimes it's even hard to know where to begin. For me, Asking questions has been one strategy, and here is a list, <laughs> a very long list of questions that I made. <laughs> uh, some, some I already uh, asked, who is here, who is not here, why, who is considered as neutral or norm, whose needs are taken into consideration, whose art is neutral, and whose art has to carry prefixes. Community art. Your urban, Sonia, your urban art, your black art, Afro, ethno, you do this political art. Who's, who are the artists presented and exhibited? Who are the designers and makers who become the target group or thematic? Who are making the curatorial choices? Who are holding the power positions? Is there a division into us and others? Are there boxes that have been checked? Are some constructed norms being reinforced or dis, uh, dismantled? And is diversity or multiculturality reduced into a topic or theme? Or is it a practice that affects and goes through the whole institution? Uh, this is uh, something that I also hear often. Now it has gone too far. We have changed already so many things we can't change anymore. So we have a fantasy of change that where we change one thing, then it's enough. And then it's really painful to understand that actually that's just the beginning. Like the first slide said, diversity is just the beginning. But just, we can just have this in mind that the end goal is equality and world peace. Also, what is the worst thing that can happen? What is the worst thing that can happen? What is the true risk? What is the best thing that can happen if we change structures? I try to make it look a little bit more professional. <laughs> what would you be willing to share or give up? Also this, the time is never right. So that's why the right, the right time is now. So this is also something I hear very often, like, hey, now we don't have the time to make these changes because we don't have money right now, or we don't have resources, and there's something a little bit more urgent right now. The time is never right, so the right time is now. Start to change things right now. And then the real risk for me is that if the art world does not become more equal, it loses its meaning. It loses its meaning. It does not mean anything anymore if it's just for a very certain, very exclusive people that can enter it. And then to my uh, last tool, which is get comfortable with uncomfort. So we need to get comfortable with uncomfort. Friction is uncomfortable. So we better get comfortable with uncomfort. Sarah Ahmed has a concept, the feminist killjoy, 
the one that stops the flow, asks difficult questions, kills the bus, and questions everything. I try to embrace that. Uh, I think in the Finnish field, I'm uh, called uh, scary spice. So uh, often, often kind of entering these situations as the one pointing out different things. Being a killjoy is easier when you're not alone. So try to find allies, try to find people that share your cause, and try to find places of support. While trying to change things, we are bound to also fail from time to time. I think this is really important to understand. We are bound to fail from time to time, and this is part of the process. We will fail because each of us can only experience the world from their own perspective. So I will never have the experience of what does it mean to be you, what kind of histories you have gone through, what kind of struggles. But I can try to communicate, but like I said, sometimes we are lost in translation. So even if I try my best, sometimes I will fail, sometimes I will hurt you, sometimes I might step on somebody's toes, and then I need to be like, hey, now I fucked up, I'm sorry. I will go and think and learn and try to be better. So then acknowledge where you failed, learn from it and try again. And for me, this is the intersectional practice. Learning, failing, learning, failing. I go down, I come back, ah, ah, learning, failing. And it's like an ongoing process, so I will not be ready. This is a lifelong process, so I hope that by uh, when I'm 90, I will still be, still be doing this learning and failing, because when I think I'm ready, if I have the feeling, hey, now I'm ready, I'm a ready feminist now, I have nothing to learn, I will not fail anymore, then the game has been lost. So learning by failure, supporting each other, trying to find spaces where we can come together and gather and practice this dreaming together. So to end, I want to go back to the beginning and remind us why, 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 remind myself why I still want to work in art. Art has the potentiality to dream of collective futures and a coexistence, a radical coexistence. So art has the potentiality to dream of things that we don't know yet how to dream of. I can imagine thousands of ways how the world will end, but I cannot imagine a single way how the world will be saved. So I need to practice this dreaming, actively practice this dreaming, because if I can't even imagine it, how could we know how to work towards it? And this is the radical potential of art, to come together to dream of decolonial, intersectional, anti-racist, feminist, pluriversal futures. Thank you. So uh, thanks a lot. We're so happy to have you here. Just yeah, sit down. Okay. Um, just so you know, the audience still has some time to send in some questions. The number is here on the um, over me over here. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Sonia. We're so glad to have you here. Your keynote is a perfect <laughs> sum up of the conference and the frame for for it um, by focusing on the problems. Um, it's so we're so happy to have your your tools uh, and because it gives us like a vision for the future. It's not only we do have problems; it's all, um, also given solutions. Um, so yeah, um, let us check first what the audience wants to know. My colleague Sarah received some questions. Exactly, dear Sonia. Um could you tell us a little bit more about your critical view on the educational system? What changes would you like, especially educational art institutions, to make in order to afford a better access for everyone? Wow, that's such a huge question. 
And I think there's so many things, like, like I said, we have to change so many things at the same time. Like, and we need, really need to start off the notion of art. What is art? Whose art is art? I studied in the theater academy in Finland. I remember, like, I've been dancing for all my life, like, different kind of uh, West African dances, street styles, but also like ballet and contemporary. And I remember going to the, like, audition and be like, like, understanding that, okay, like, somehow, This is not art, but then, oh wow, hey, great, now, phew, she can also do this art. Okay, now she can enter. So I really remember re th these really clear things that, okay, what is art and what is not art and whose art is art and whose art is culture. And I think this is also something that many art institutions are not willing to talk about. Because then suddenly, if we would understand that, okay, this can be art, this can be art, this can be art, then many of the teachers don't actually have any tools to teach you. Because they only have a very, very narrow understanding of what, what art is. So when I was doing my master's, my professor couldn't help me at all when I was like dealing with West African cosmologies. And they were like, I can't help yourself. And then I felt I was also teaching the teachers. So I think that's like, let's start to talk about what is art. Like that's like the first thing. Yeah. Okay, Sarah, do we have a second question? Yes. Can you tell us about your favorite art pro project that you watched in the last two years? <laughs> oh, there's so many. Um, or one of your favorites. I think that's also fine. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, like, there's so many things. And also, like, this is, I think, an interesting question. Like, what do we look, like, what do we look at when we look at uh, art? Like, what, what, is, what, what makes it my favorite? Often, like, my favorite things are my friends' things. Because I love my friends, I go watch their performances, like, I like that because I love that person. So, like, to be really honest. And then I've also tried to give up of this good and bad, because I'm also thinking maybe my liking or not liking a work is in irrelevant. But maybe I can try to look at what things are there, or what, what things are revealed for me, and then what, what things are hidden. But, uh, for example, now I, like, very recently I just saw uh, a work by my friends. I know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I know the, knew these people and I know that they have had, like, a very long and uh, difficult process. And these people come from different backgrounds as well. And then just, like, experience that energy, that coming together, especially in the times of pandemic. Like, being live. Like, life is best lived live. That's what I took from it, and yeah. So that was a little bit silly. My friend's performance uh, a few weeks ago had been one of the favorite things I've seen for a while. <laughs> Can um, I just ask for uh, how was the performance called, and was it in Finland, in Helsinki? Yeah, it's called Betty. <laughs> okay, is it accessible online? No, unfortunately not. And also it's in Finnish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sarah? Which stra uh, strategies would you apply? How to deal with internalized sexism, racism, and other discriminating aggressions in working together with other artists? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, in a safe space or so-called safe space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lifelong process. Like, I had, I have a Congolese colleague uh, uh, for Stanley Niekula that told me that you need to take yourself out of the margins. So, I was born in 85 in white, white, white Finland, uh, and I've lived most of my life as being the only one in the spaces. And that changes me. That has changed my body. And that, like, so I've, I've learned, like, the world has taught me that I am the other. So, like, like, like I said in the keynote, like, this repetition this like years and years and years of repetition of being the other like has left a mark. 
So then what I try to do in our own processes is at least uh, first acknowledge what moves me, what has moved me, what has changed me, acknowledge those things, and then practice centralizing yourself. Another friend of mine said that her radical practice is, I am normal. Going to the spaces as a person of co a queer person of color and being like, I am normal. This is normal. The world is crazy. Like it is. It's crazy. It's racist. It's sexist. It's fucked up. It's crazy. I am normal. The world is crazy. And for example, here in the workshop, uh, we were doing one of uh, the exercises that we did also in Cosmic Latte, which is uh, this imagining practice. Try to imagine a world where, the, where there is no longer structural oppression. Try to imagine a world where there is no longer structural oppression. There's no longer capitalism. There's no longer, like we have solved the climate uh, crisis. How would your body feel? How would your body feel? And that's also like the radical potentiality of art. With art, I can do things that are not possible in the so-called real world. I can, I can be like, oh, I'm a tree. I'm a tree. I'm not a tree. I know I'm not a tree. I'm a tree. And I really try to be in this treeness, this tree. And now, me, this that I was a tree for three seconds, will be a part of my lived history. I went through that. I have some kind of reminiscence of being a, three, a tree for three, tree for three seconds. So the same thing if when we're doing these decolonial dreaming practices. I know the world is not ready, but trying to be in the state of imagining what would my body feel like if the world would be equal. Like I think that changes us. And that's kind of like an activist practice as well. So how to treat, dream inside the structures, dream inside of the struggle. We have to do certain things. We have to demonstrate. We have to do this. We have to do that. But then also how to dream outside of the struggle. What if? What if? It's year 3020 and there's no longer structural oppression. What would Sonia Linfors do on the stage? I don't have to deal with racism anymore. I don't have to deal with transphobia anymore. What would I do? What kind of art would I make? How would I feel? How would I use all that time? Maybe I would do gardening. I don't know. But like, and that has given me so much energy. So, so much energy. Thank you. Um, the next one goes into the field of cultural appropriation. It asks, asks, where does it start? <laughs> also a big question, I know. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, so every, like, like I said, everything has history, everything has ideology, and cultural, uh, cultural appropriation is not a cause, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of the unequal world. It's a symptom of colonialism, capitalism, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia. It's a symptom of this unequal world. So if we wouldn't have these hierarchies, we would just have cultural exchange. Yeah, because so taking something from primitive cultures and then somebody else taking from uh, Picasso and we, we wouldn't have the notion of primitive. We wouldn't have the notion of West and the rest. The world would be different. But as long as we're not there yet, we have to acknowledge these historical entanglements and understand that white Western art often operates, and that's also the history of white Western art, like all our Finnish uh, golden era visual artists, I went to Japan, I went to Guinea, I went there and I was inspired by their culture and then I made art of their culture. So that's kind of our history. And if that's the history, the structure, structure of how art has happened, then we have to like renegotiate that. And at the same time, we're always influenced by each other. So culture or art never happens in a silo, but 
we need to start fighting for equality right now in the art field. So maybe in a hundred years, we could be in a space, a place, an art field, which would be equal already. Okay, Sarah, I think we do have time for one more question. One more. Sounds good. How do you work with intergenerational artists with different cultures, such as skill sharing? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, how to work? I think everything is, it's, it's a lot about listening and also like I work in diff, diff, very different kinds of communities. So I work with teenagers, I, I've worked with elderly people and it's really about listening and understanding that, for example, if I come as a director or choreographer, I feel I'm the facilitator. So I'm the, I'm the gardener somehow. So I try to make space for people's needs and my needs are not in the center. Like, I don't need, like, if I'm working with different communities, maybe my need isn't the centralized one, but I can use my tools or what I know to make space for others as well. Uh, listening is super important. And then this comes also, like, this, uh, to this, like, how can we meet on equal terms? So I cannot come to, like, teenager, like, hey... Let me tell you, this is the way you do it. Uh, don't do that, do this, this is the best way. Because they already have so much knowledge of things I don't have any knowledge about. So kind of like, yeah, but I think this, I've, I've been teaching for so long, like I was just joking that this is my 20th, uh, 20th uh, art uh, anniversary of being an artist so I've started so young teaching so I think it's just yeah it's just about trying to meet on equal planes try to listen uh, try to be humble also joy joy is important joy and laughter and humor and understanding that there are responsibilities that my responsibility is to take care that others have as, as safe as possible a uh, place to be in And then what, uh, one more thing, which was this, that understand that you don't understand. That sometimes we use the same words and we need, mean different things. Like English is not my first language. What I mean by feminism might be some, totally something else that somebody else means with it. And if some people haven't had the privilege of having access to academia or something else, so they might use another word and in some languages there isn't even a word for certain concepts so really understanding that we don't understand but we can still try to like try to move towards that try to communicate uh, share a moment uh, a laugh or a dance yeah thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, and thank you so much for being here I think this is the beginning. Thank you. So, ich würde jetzt gerne noch einmal Nicola Bramkamp und Lisa Jobt auf die Bühne bitten. Ähm, wir werden jetzt ein kleines Wrap-up der Konferenz machen. Ähm, Ich habe noch kurz Sonja Lindfoss meine große Verehrung ausgesprochen, deswegen bin ich ein bisschen spät, Nicola. Es ist ja nicht so, dass ich das nicht getan hätte, ich bin nur als Dramaturgin dann immer so richtig auf den Punkt und formuliere das. Und das ist jetzt unsere richtig, richtig schwere, große Aufgabe. Herzlich willkommen nochmal zu unserem aller, allerletzten Programmpunkt. Wir müssen es jetzt irgendwie schaffen, diese drei füllhornvollen Tage zusammen zu bündeln und auf den Punkt zu bringen, worüber wir gesprochen haben. Ja, da wird schon gelacht im Publikum. Ne? Wie wollen die das hinkriegen? Das schaffen wir natürlich überhaupt nicht. Aber ähm, was wir, glaube ich, beschreiben können und deshalb fand ich jetzt auch die Keynote von Sonja Lindforsch noch mal so brillant, ist erstmal zu beschreiben, dass all das, was 
wir mit der Initiative Burning Issues gewollt haben, sich an dieser Corona-merkwürdig hakeligen Konferenzstruktur am Ende eben doch eingelöst hat, nämlich einen Ton zu finden und eine Haltung zu finden, die dazu einlädt, sich gegenseitig kennenzulernen. Denn am Ende geht es um Sichtbarkeit und zwar um Sichtbarkeit auf der Bühne, um Zugänge. Es geht aber auch um das Sichtbarmachen von Menschen, dass man sich gegenseitig in die Augen guckt. Und das ist uns im Moment natürlich so unglaublich schwer zugänglich durch die koronäischen Zeiten, in denen wir uns befinden, dass es ein ganz tolles Privileg ist und ich wirklich sehr, sehr dankbar bin, dass wir das heute hier ähm, noch erleben konnten und dieses Wochenende noch nutzen konnten, bevor es dann für lange Zeit wieder nicht möglich ist. Auf der anderen Seite muss man eben auch sagen, wir haben dadurch richtig viel tollen Content produziert und dank der großartigen Unterstützung vom Kampnagel-Team auch Stoff und Futter für die dunklen Tage da draußen ähm, geschaffen, dass man sich noch angucken kann. Und ich glaube, dass das etwas ist, was wir dieses Wochenende gelernt haben, dass die Dinge, die wir im Theater produzieren, ja oft einfach im Moment sind. Das ist ein großer Vorteil, das ist ganz große Qualität unserer Kunstform. Es ist aber auch toll, wenn Dinge nachhaltiger produziert werden und eine längere Beständigkeit haben und Zugang haben für viele, viele, die eben heute nicht hier live sein konnten. Von daher freue ich mich selber auch, all das nochmal nachzuhören und nachzugucken. An der Stelle möchte ich mich ganz herzlich bei Luca Sonnen, unserer Projektassistentin, bedanken. Die, wo ist sie? Ach so, wir klatschen, ja. Die so ähm, Sonja Lindforsch so toll angekündigt hat und das Q&A auf dieser großen Bühne gemacht hat. Vielen Dank, liebe Luca Sonnen. Wir haben eben auf dem Panel darüber gesprochen, wie viele... Intersektionen es gibt, wie viele Wege auf dieser Kreuzung, die uns ja ähm, dieses ganze Wochenende beschäftigt haben, wie viele es gibt und wie schwer natürlich nachzuvollziehen ist, wenn ein Unfall passiert, aus welcher Richtung welches Auto kam. Und mit jeder Perspektive, die neu dazukommt, gewinnen wir noch komplexere Kommunikationsstrukturen, Strukturen überhaupt, Lösungsansätze und dass man aber diese Arbeit nicht scheut, dass man nicht sagt, das habe ich jetzt gelernt, das ist mein Fokus, das ist vielleicht auch meine intrinsische Motivation, ich fokussiere mich da drauf und lasse das andere links und rechts liegen. Das bedarf viel Arbeit, das hat viel mit Sensibilität zu tun, das hat auch viel mit Bildungsarbeit zu tun und dass wir das an diesem Wochenende erleben durften, dass wir so unglaublich viel tollen Input bekommen haben, dass Menschen ihre Erlebnisse mit uns teilen, das ist, glaube ich, eines der wichtigsten Erfahrungen, die wir von Burning Issues mit Kampnagel mitnehmen. Und ich habe eben, als wir da gesessen haben, das Gefühl gehabt, Kunst schafft ja auch manchmal Metaphern und Bilder, die man sich eben gut merken kann, viel mehr als alles andere, viel mehr als jeder wissenschaftliche Vortrag. Oder, ähm, und das, was die HFBK-Studierenden erfunden haben mit dem Marktplatz der Möglichkeiten. Wir haben immer wieder gesagt, das ist das Herzstück der Konferenz. Das ist es auf einer aktivistischen Ebene, weil Menschen sich da begegnen und ihre Arbeit präsentieren und sich vernetzen und dadurch eine Grassroot-Bewegung starten kann, die tatsächlich das Potenzial hat, Strukturen äh, zu reformieren. Auf der anderen Seite gibt es aber noch eine ganz große metaphorische Bedeutung von diesem Marktstand, der mir oder von diesem Marktplatz, der, die uns heute noch mal aufgegangen ist, weil es darum geht, wie schaffe ich eigentlich eine Bühne, in der man all die unterschiedlichen Perspektiven wahrnehmen kann und sich trotzdem sicher fühlt und einen Stand zu haben, der gut aussieht, der mich gut präsentiert, der mein Safe Space ist, wo meine Anliegen präsentiert werden, wo ich auch anderthalb Meter Abstand habe und zwar nicht nur wegen Corona, weil mir Leute nicht auf den Leib rücken können, weil Leute nicht eindringen können in meine Aura, mich ähm, beschimpfen können. Das ist erstmal eine sehr, sehr komfortable Zone. Und dann nicht, wie sonst ganz oft, wie das jede von uns kennt, rumzurennen mit seinem Anliegen und zu sagen, hey, hier, willst du, kannst du mal, guck mal, was ich habe, schließ dich doch mir an. Sondern die Leute kommen zu mir. Ich stehe in meinem Marktstand, die Menschen kommen, sie geben mir, sie fragen mich, ich kann mein Wissen weitergeben. Das ist eine sehr, sehr, sehr souveräne Position. 
Und das ist nur der eine Marktstand. Dann haben wir ja einen ganzen Marktplatz. Und dieser Marktplatz besteht aus ganz vielen verschiedenen Marktständen. Und gemeinsam geben wir ein Bild ab. Gemeinsam haben wir die Kraft, sozusagen ähm, den Markt zu gestalten. Und wenn wir über Märkte sprechen, das haben wir ganz viel gemacht über den Markt, was für SchauspielerInnen sind gerade angesagt, was für Themen will das Publikum sehen, dann haben wir, glaube ich, auf dieser Konferenz einen Marktplatz geschaffen, der uns allen Safe Spaces gibt, um unsere intrinsischen Motivationen aufzutanken, mit denen rauszugehen und auf der anderen Seite uns aber eben auch zu vernetzen, ohne dass ich meine eigene Komfort- oder Grenzzone so weit aufgeben muss, dass ich zerfließe. Und dieser Markt ist unendlich erweiterbar. Wir können der größte Markt werden. Wir können ein Flohmarkt sein. Wir können ein ähm, Lebensmittelmarkt sein. Wir können ein Klamottenmarkt sein. Wir haben alle Möglichkeiten. Das ist ja das Tolle am Theater. Und diese Multiperspektive, die hat uns, glaube ich, dieses Wochenende unglaublich bereichert. Die hat uns ähm, ja, angestrengt, aber eben am Ende des Tages auch wirklich einen großen Schritt weitergeführt. Genau so ist es, Nicola. Wir haben übrigens noch einen weiteren Marktplatz quasi nebenan gehabt. Wir haben eine kleine Videogrußbotschaft noch ganz spontan eingesendet bekommen von Anne Schneider. Sie gehört zur Geschäftsführung des Bundesverbands der Freien Darstellenden Künste. Und ähm, sie hatten just zwei, drei Tage vor Burning Issues Meets Kampnagel eine ziemlich ähnliche Konferenz. Und was dabei rausgekommen ist, das trägt sie uns jetzt einmal gleich kurz vor. Können wir das Video mit Anne schneiden? Liebe ja, Anne, hallo. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, ganz herzliche Grüße sendet der Bundesverband Freie Darstellende Künste. Wir freuen uns sehr auf den Austausch zu in den vergangenen Tagen entstandenen Impulsen. Ich denke, es ist uns allen klar, dass wir am Anfang eines noch äh, vor uns liegenden langen Weges stehen und für uns wurde in den letzten Tagen, wir haben letzte Woche vielfalt sensible Prozesse in den freien darstellenden Künste im Rahmen von Fachtagen diskutiert, wurde eben einmal mehr ganz deutlich, dass wir immer noch in Gatekeeper-Funktionen verharren und insofern hoffe ich, dass ein nächstes Grußwort vielleicht von jemand anderem als mir, als weiße Frau ohne Behinderung gehalten wird und ähm, außerdem wurde deutlich, dass wir eigentlich bei allen Handlungsschritten, die wir so tun, ob es die Konzeption einer neuen Homepage ist, die Planung einer Veranstaltung oder das Aufsetzen eines neuen Programmes, noch viel stärker über diskriminierungsarme Strukturen nachdenken sollten und uns das auch vorgenommen haben. Ähm, genau und insofern hoffe ich, dass wir alle immer wieder darüber nachdenken, wo wir Macht teilen und abgeben können und äh, vor allem auch uns miteinander und gegenseitig weiterbilden. Ich denke, das ist eine ganz große Aufgabe von uns und insofern freue ich mich sehr auf den Austausch und bis bald. Liebe Grüße. Dank, lieber Bundesverband der Freien Darstellenden Künste, der zu unseren Verbündeten gehört. Nikola, ich würde sagen, wir haben eh ganz viel Dank noch auszusprechen. Wir fangen mal an bei dem Team Kampnagel. Ja, wir fangen an, uns zu bedanken. Und ich habe einen kleinen Add-on. Das tut mir leid, wenn man mir dann ein Mikro gibt, dann muss ich dann doch... Ähm, Kurz noch was sagen, es geht darum, Macht zu teilen und Macht, zu ab, äh, Macht abzugeben, hat Anne Schneider eben gesagt. Es geht aber auch darum, Macht zu erobern. Und ich finde, das dürfen wir nicht vergessen vor lauter, ähm, ähm, wir dürfen uns nicht aufweichen. Ich fand es ganz großartig in der Performance von Shishi Pop, wenn äh, Johanna auf diesem Bett liegt und sagt, diesen Arbeitsplatz habe ich mir selber erschaffen. Ich würde als alte Frau auf dieser Bühne nicht stehen, wenn ich mir das selber nicht erschaffen hätte. Und sozusagen das empowernd nochmal zusätzlich zu dem, was absolut richtig ist, mit nach draußen zu geben, auch Macht zu erobern, glaube ich, ist ein ganz wichtiger Punkt. Und die Institution, die uns hier ähm, mit uns gemeinsam zusammen äh, dieses Projekt ermöglicht hat, Krampnagel, die Kulturfabrik Krampnagel, ist wirklich eines der tollsten Beispiele, wie das gehen kann, wie das funktionieren kann. 
selten einen Ort erlebt, der von vom Restaurant bis hin ähm, zum Einlasspersonal so sehr eine Offenheit atmet wie Kampnagel. Und wir möchten uns ganz, ganz herzlich bedanken. Und wünschen uns, dass ihr auf die Bühne kommt. Bitte für einen großen Applaus. Und zwar bei Sirvan Ali und der ganzen Ton- und Videoabteilung, die diese ähm, digitalen Zugänge überhaupt ermöglicht haben. Und zwar in aller kürzester Zeit. Ein ganz großer Applaus an Johanna Thomas, die Produktionsleiterin, an das ganze Technikteam. Vielleicht kann Johanna Nein. ja hochkommen. Warte mal, warte, warte mal, die müssen schon hochkommen, oder? Ja, das ist ja... Die Doch, kommen die gleich. müssen hochkommen. Doch. Doch, ich wünsche mir, dass alle, die an dieser Konferenz beteiligt sind, bitte einmal hier auf die Bühne kommen. Das würde mich... Nur die, die möchten, selbstverständlich. Und die Abstände einhalten, das ist auch noch äh, eine wichtige ihr Aufgabe. Winkt. Ich sehe euch, ihr winkt. Dankeschön. Vielen Wir Dank. bedanken uns recht herzlich Dank. beim Kampnagel-Technik-Team, bei Amelie Dolfelhardt, bei Alina Buchberger und bei Uta Lamberts aus der Dramaturgie. Außerdem bitte ich auf die Bühne Sarah Keiluweit, die für uns als Pressereferentin tätig war und eine fantastische Journalistin ist. Bei Luca Sonnen, die unsere Projektassistentin war und eine tolle Theaterwissenschaftlerin ist. Bei Franziska Bald, unserer Geschäftsführerin. Kommst du gar nicht runter? Du bleibst da oben. Komm bitte, Franziska Bald. Die Geschäftsführerin und Projektleiterin von Burning Issues äh, rein und äh, vom Ensemble-Netzwerk. Bei Marielle Sterra vom Social Media Team, die haben nämlich dort für ganz viel Content gesorgt, der auch noch nachzuklicken ist. Und bei Dennis Depter, der auch für unser Social Media arbeitet. Außerdem bei der Fotografin Rebecca Rütten, die das Fotoshooting soft and radikal gemacht hat. Die Fotos werden in den nächsten Tagen immer wieder gepostet werden und ihr werdet sie auf unseren Kampagnen finden. Die Fotografin Anna Spindeldreier, bei der möchte ich mich auch ganz, ganz herzlich bedanken. Anna ist hier rumgerannt, drei Tage und und hat ganz viele Fotos gemacht. Das ist deswegen so wichtig, weil sie damit für Sichtbarkeit von Menschen sorgt, die gar keine richtig, vielleicht teilweise professionellen Fotos von sich haben. Anna, bitte komm einmal, weil das ist einfach ähm, super, super wichtig, auch für einen professionellen Auftritt, gute Bilder zu haben. Und Anna ist eine tolle Fotografin. Ich bedanke mich ganz herzlich bei Michael Rüger, der als Ersatz eingesprungen ist, für Julie Rosskopf, unsere Videografin. Ähm, die konnte leider aus Krankheits nicht Corona gründen, nicht da sein. Michi, komm doch auch mal auf die Bühne. Jetzt da. So, danke schön. Und bei Charlotte Weber, der Videoassistentin. Charlotte, komm mal hoch, hol dir mal deinen Applaus ab, weil ihr seid hier einfach drei Tage schwitzend rumgerannt und habt versucht, die Konferenz noch viel besser aussehen zu lassen. Kommt auf die Bühne, ich gehe hier zur Seite, als sie vielleicht in Wahrheit war. Das ist nämlich immer die Maßgabe an alle. So. Und deswegen möchte ich mich auch bei allen bedanken. Und warte, Lisa, wir haben noch ganz ja. viele Leute vergessen. Wir ja, haben klar. noch vergessen, das Team von Young Burning Issues, das bitten wir auf die Bühne. Bitte weiter klatschen. Die Studierenden der HFMT, die mit ihrer Performance der Weiße Mann tritt zurück, für viel Aufsehen gesorgt hat. Wir bedanken uns bei unseren Kooperationspartnern der HFBK und der HFM, bei all unseren Förderinnen und Unterstützerinnen, bei all unseren Speakerinnen und Marketenderinnen, die jetzt da ähm, noch da sind, die da waren. Und natürlich an alle, alle, die zugeguckt haben. Ja, genau. Vielen, vielen Dank an alle da draußen im Internet, die zugeguckt haben bei uns. Es ist total toll, dass ihr euch wieder vom Computer gehängt habt, um Teil zu sein und um das Wissen mit aufzubekommen. Vielen, vielen Dank, dass ihr auch dabei wart. Ganz liebe Grüße auch an meinen Vater, der hat zugeguckt und der hat jetzt die Chance, auch diese komplexen Inhalte mal mitzubekommen. Also in diesem Sinne, Art can change. Ja.